Well, everybody join me in welcoming Pamela Holly. Yeah. Yeah. Always good to know what's forward and back, right? And have it have it right side up. Um, thank you all so much for having me here today. Um, I was a Dookie, and I'm coming on campus, and I'm like looking at all these amazing things that have changed, and it's been really, really wonderful to be back here. Actually, one of my um, best friends from Atlanta flew up, so we spent the day reminiscing. And do any of you guys know Bonds on Ninth Street? Oh my gosh, you don't know, come on. Are you serious? Okay, thank you, someone knows this. So this is a Chinese place, hole in the wall on 9th Street. It's like five bucks and the price hasn't changed since I've been here. So we went, we actually got it and got the same food, everything we had from a dookie. So some things don't change, which is good. Um, what I wanna talk to you about today is really finding something that is not a career. I want you all to find a calling. That's what I've been able to find. It was not easy, and it's very, very exciting when you can find something, whether it's on the side or full-time, something that really motivates you and drives you in life. And that's what I feel so fortunate about and look forward to sharing you about today, and also some of the innovations in social entrepreneurship. So, oops, what am I doing here? There we go. Um, so social entrepreneurship. We need to make a difference in a strategic, business-like way. Um, this was Peter Samuelson, a film producer who affected me deeply in 1996 when I was desperately searching to find what I loved to do. And he was running a nonprofit that was different than anything I'd ever heard of. It just wasn't the traditional nonprofit. He said, we need to be doing this differently, more with business principles. And that is literally when it was just changed my life so much to know this can be something that's strategic. Social entrepreneurs are not content to give a fish or teach how to get, how to get a fish. You really want to revolutionize the fishing industry. You want to revolutionize your sector. You want to change that sector. And so it's really not just enough to teach someone. You want to be changing the industry in some influential way. That's what true, deep down social entrepreneurship is. So some of the fundamentals are that it's not doing good works because that's just service. It's not changing the world because that's just a good person. It's not nonprofit. Why can't you be for profit? It could be government. I haven't heard a lot in government, but who says it can't be in that realm? It's not innovative because that's just innovation and it could be for profit, nonprofit, anything. And a new idea that changes system, that's entrepreneurship. So then what is it? Social entrepreneurship is a mission driven organization that revolutionizes a system or a product in a scalable way. And it also uniquely addresses social need and makes money. That definition is different than a lot of ones out there. Not all of them say you need to make money. I don't think you can be a social entrepreneur without making money. You need to show that you can monetize your service and find a smart way to generate revenue. Really, if it's not that, then you're either a for-profit or a non-profit. And so to me, this is absolutely critical. I've never been a part of any non-profit, for-profit organization unless it generates revenue. You've got to be able to prove social value and capital markets value. So the structure of that can be for-profit, socially responsible for-profit, non-profit, or hybrid. People say it needs to be a certain one. It doesn't. It can be any of those. This one is very complex, and that's another discussion we can talk about later. But a lot of that became very, very popular in California to do hybrids, and it's a lot of work. You've got to manage two boards. You've got some very complex regulations. So as much, be careful about things that sound really hip and innovative and take a lot more time to manage than actually doing the mission of what you want to do. So watch out for things that sound like a cool buzzword and really get down to the core of make sure your innovation is about what you're doing, not your structure. Have your structure serve you so it's efficient for you. So the top qualities of an entrepreneur, and think about this, because I have people come to me all the time and say, could I be a social entrepreneur? And these are the questions you want to ask yourself. Are you story driven, cause driven? What's your story? Why do you want to do this? Because as one investor said to me once, Pamela, are you ready to run a marathon? And another one, and another one back to back, and another one, pace yourself. You've got to really have a story that motivates you. It can't just be a neat idea that maybe you want to try out. Boundless drive, willingness to be unorthodox. It's not easy, sometimes you've got to push the mark. I'll tell you a quick story. When I was starting Universal Giving, one of the heads of the top foundations in the nation said to me, Pamela, is there a market for international giving? Wow. That is really like something where you gotta be unorthodox. Whereas now we know everyone, lots of people wanna give internationally or we're aware of things like that. So things that seem the norm now, you'll have to push the mark with things that don't seem the norm and have the courage to do it. You're persistent, you have <coughs> strong ethics. Don't lose that. 
Good entrepreneurs, long staying power, have good ethics and are good people. The highest driver of successful social entrepreneurs is your story. So I'm going to go into mine and hopefully you'll be able to find yours too. So from childhood to global social entrepreneur, be, be prepared for a little bit of humor because as Matt said, I do improv. So I sometimes don't always follow what's happening and a lot of these slides I haven't seen before. So the person who does them, I ask her to create them and I get up here, so I make sure that it's fresh so I don't always know what's coming next. So let's see what happens. All right, I do it. So here I am, yes, little chipmunk cheeks, all right, so that is me and my sister and my Oma, one of the absolute most amazing people in the world and we'll talk about it later. So I'm here on the beach in Half Moon Bay in California. The big joke, running joke with the family is I had such buck teeth I could not close my mouth. And when we went to the orthodontist, he said to Mrs. my mom, he said, uh, Mrs. Holly, um, we'll, we'll do what we can. And I'm standing right there. I'm like, I'm 10. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not deaf. And I'm like, what, what does he mean, Mom? And she says, I think he means he's going to be able to close your mouth. Okay, great. All right, super. So I clearly can do that now, which is nice. So here I am with a full regalia of my um, neck gear, everything. Obviously showing some innovation by having a puka shell necklace and going to bed with that at night. So in my little nightgown. Um, be freedom to be yourself. Okay? Be, you might be a little bit different. Not everything might be coordinated. Pivotal moment. Watch for these in your life. You will walk by many pivotal moments and listen to yourself and your experience. For me, here I am moving into a different phase, tomboy phase, right? So here I am, tomboy, I'm on the right, with my eyes out and my khaki pants and my little short hair, and we're in Mexico with my family, with whom I am extremely close. Parents are married, best friends of the spark, very close with my sister. We're here, joyful family vacation, and I went from a cruise ship to a cul-de-sac. And it changed my life. You can walk by this or you can make this the story of your life. You can walk by like this, or you can say, this is what has literally shaped my life story. I saw this, game over for me. I saw begging, starving children, and I had come from such a loving, wonderful home that this rocked my world. I was like, this is impossible that this exists out here. Dad, why couldn't you tell me about this? And he said, honey, you're only 12. Well, now we know a lot of 10-year-olds, 8-year-olds who are doing things in philanthropy early on. But my point is, is you can walk by your story or you can engage with it. You see these moments, you listen to yourself and find out what it is that's going to drive you in life. From there, I went to Guatemala. And some of these slides are going to be disturbing. I'm preparing you right now because there's going to be humor and there's going to be heavy. Because that's what life is. It's both. And to embrace it all. So I went on a rampage internationally. There weren't like all these volunteer opportunities really created. I had to go find them myself. So I went to Guatemala and I went there and we went to de lice children and we helped them shampoo them. They hadn't been shampooed in months. And we picked all the lice out of their hair. But guess what? There's another story on the way. Because on the way I'm seeing all these people lying down on the ground with, with, with cloths on their face. What is that? Does anyone know? Why were they lying down? because there was a local shoe factory there and they were getting high on the glue from the shoe factory. They were so depressed, they were passing out by, by sniffing the glue. So here I am on my way to d -Lice children, but there's another story. There are other people that need to be served. India, working in microfinance, that's my story. I'm there to go help in microfinance. Remote village of, of Bangalore, four hours outside of Bangalore, before it became the Silicon Valley of India. 25% suicide rate of the farmers. They cannot provide for their families. They get more and more debt. The crops don't come through. They don't have enough water. 25%. And yet here's another story because in a lot of these local remote villages, not everywhere, but in some of them, if you have a girl child, that's where it goes. They get taken care of on the stove. Cambodia. Beautiful people working with the victims of Pol Pot regime, helping people with no limbs blasted off from mines on the ground, helping them get trained in common computers and helping them have livelihoods. And here we are at this beautiful stupa, and I said, what a beautiful temple. And, he said, and I said, look at all this beautiful land and green trees and green everything. And he said, yes, it's green because of the tragedy we've gone through. 
because underneath here are all the skulls of all the people in the stupa, all the bodies that were buried here from Pol Pot's regime. They're buried underneath the ground. That's why it's so green, Pamela. All these people were killed. I don't know how much you know about that, but every intellectual was tried. They, if they saw you with glasses, they were threatened by you. If you had glasses, you tried to get rid of them or go blind for the rest of your life because they would try and kill you or not only that, but if you research Pol Pot's regime, what they had there was a very serious situation where they actually brainwashed the children to kill their parents. Really serious situations, you guys, that are happening today as well. So that led to a life of vision of service for me. All those experiences, that one cult psych experience led to this going internationally and creating this knowledge and understanding of what's really happening in the world. So at first it was one-on-one -on -one with people. This was in El Salvador and then listening and helping other people. And then it really came to be helping the whole world and that shaped my whole life story. So that led into universal giving. I had to think, am I gonna go travel all over the world or am I gonna go create something that can leverage thousands of other people to get involved? And those are decisions you'll have to make. Do you wanna serve one-on-one -on -one or do you wanna serve thousands of people and make something scalable? And here we connect giving and volunteer opportunities to people all over the world that are vetted, that are curated. So our public site allows you to volunteer in the Philippines or construct a health clinic. And one of my favorites is a sports gift. Give a ball, change a life. And you can do that for five, 10, $25. Give it as a birthday gift to a friend or give it as a holiday gift or give it to on um, Father's Day or rescue a Nepali girl from captivity. So we have things that are very light and very serious. I never realized the big range we'd see at Universal Giving. There are people, the most popular gift we have on Mother's Day is, is gentlemen giving a gift of $100 to stop women from hemorrhaging in childbirth. That's one of the gifts they give to their wives. I think they're trying to like honor childbirth. And then there's other things we have, which is train an exotic elephant and help train them to survive in, in, the, in their habitat. So things that are very light and things that are more serious. We also go into crisis giving, where we raise for crises, both at the inception at the beginning and in rebuilding the community. Both are important. There's two different levels of crises there. Not just getting that immediate food, but then getting it in so people can have jobs and, and livelihoods. Then we give a gift. You give a donation as a gift. For example, sponsor an orphan chimpanzee. This is one of our most popular ones. It's joyful, it's fun. It's also animal oriented, which is one of the most popular areas. Fund a project. This is something that's longer. We find with people who want to fund something that's longer that might take three months, such as building a well, something like that, so it's not just quick. So you have to think about giving in different ways and what meets certain people's needs, people who want to build for the long term, people who want something quick. And that might be a water system, something like that. And then give a gift certificate, and this is empowering other people to go make the choice themselves. How do they want to give? So instead of you choosing it for them, you say you go choose. This is very empowering for families, for kids, for your nephews, your nieces, your cousins, where they can say, I'm giving this to you as a birthday gift. Now you go decide. You choose what you think is important. And then they're looking through and educating themselves on all these different types of ways to give. So it's the power of choice, zero impact on the environment because it's all online. You can personalize it and make it for friends or family, celebrating birthdays, graduation. If you're a student organization, it could be a welcome gift or recognize hard work and achievement or winning an award. There's a lot of ways you can inculcate giving by giving these gift certificates in many ways throughout your life. So that it's not just something that you do in the holiday time or end of year. If you're a company, we're seeing this a lot, you recognize employee performance by giving them a gift certificate. You can do five years of service, a citizenship award, a holiday gift. So all of those things help can be integrated in your life. So think about your service and think, how can that actually get into different parts of your life? Volunteering. So important and this is volunteering with vetted opportunities in more than 100 countries we know that giving and volunteering go together and so those people that volunteer are two-thirds more likely to give. so if you start an idea or service think about ideas or or services that can help mutually reinforce each other those people who volunteer are much more likely to give your hearts in it you believe in the leaders you want to be involved in it so ways you can do that is help elephants in Thailand and then when people come back from volunteering, we create a circle. They then raise for a cause. They come back and they do a fundraiser for the volunteer project. So it's this circle going back and forth where you're creating a list highlighting all your favorite projects 
and you can say, here are my favorite causes. This is my birthday wish list um, or an, a wedding registry. And you list and you create a raise for a cause page, add causes to your list, send it to friends and family, ask them to donate, and then you social media it out. So you've got this list of your volunteer opportunities or any opportunities that you like, and then you can send people to it and they can help support it financially. So what you're really doing is with volunteering, you're also raising for a cause. When you volunteer, you come back, create your raise for a cause page, and it's a circle and it's reinforcing the two services. So for example, here's my birthday wish list. I've got women rights, and it's like help expand a small business, construct a village clinic, medical supplies, and health care. I can drive people to this page, and then they can support me in these efforts. So those are the things you want to do to personalize it, whatever your service might be, and keep learning and growing that way. We didn't really have that conjoining of the volunteering and giving at the beginning, and we've learned it continue to grow with the service as we, as we continue to progress. So how do we then make this model, which is free, make it monetized so that we make money? So we've got two different services, and we'll go over briefly. Universal Giving's unique models were 100%. Our tagline is give your 100%. You don't take a cut on the donation. All organizations are vetted by our quality model. We have two services of giving and volunteering in 100 countries all over the world. And we generate revenue. So our key milestones are Jefferson Award and Homepage and Oprah.com, White House and Ernst & Young. And then our results are that we've joined Billion Rising as a TV philanthropy expert, we've spoken at dozens of events, and we've dispersed 1,900 payments just for one corporate client, helping them in their giving. We've vetted over nearly 4,000 organizations, passed $11 million through in philanthropy, and matched 17,000 volunteers. So some of those are results that we've done. And it's not easy because you're basically running two services, giving and volunteering. So you have to think about how those dynamics are different. They're related, but they're different. So the vetting I started when I came back, I went and I saw things that were absolutely inexcusable, complete fraud on the ground. And then other things that were very benevolent, but people weren't trained. And then I saw other exemplary organizations. So then I came back and I said, all right, we need a six stage vetting model. And now it's 24 stages. So when you start something, you've got to continually innovate. That's four times the amount of vetting. We have 24 stages of vetting now. And how do we do that? By watching the landscape, seeing what's needed. Now we vet social media. We watch nonprofits. We watch and see how they comport themselves online. We do um, venture capitalist vetting. We look at how venture capitalists vet their deals, and we do the same thing. That's where I grew up in Silicon Valley. We look at leadership. We look at finances. We look at a whole myriad of different things. It's trademarked. It's proprietary. So it's like our secret sauce, we don't release the whole thing. So if you look at this, one of the things I encourage you to do is look at what this is, the social return on investment for you is. For us, we look at the value of the volunteer. So let's look at this. You have the value of the volunteers, estimated value of the volunteer's time is $23. That's through independent sector. If it's $23, if someone volunteers for 40 hours, it's worth almost $1,000 for a week. The volunteer trip is two weeks. So to date, we have matched 17,000 volunteers with $31 million worth of volunteer hours. That's social entrepreneurship. Talking about how you monetize things to show the value you're creating, you put that in your funder PowerPoint, and that's how you fundraise. To say, look, this is what we've created, $31 million. Not of for-profit, not of revenue for you, of social value that's invested. And this doesn't even count all the people that you've talked to and the people you've influenced. This is just strictly looking at the dollar amount of the volunteers. This isn't looking at the personal relationships. This isn't looking how your voting changes, your consciousness changes, your empathy changes, your com compassion. All of that is like innumerable, but so important in life, how you will affect people. So we're this go-to site of giving and volunteering across the world. It's free. Give your 100%. And we, our whole mission is to create a world where giving and volunteering is a natural part of everyday life. We want it to be natural. We don't even want you to think about it. I hope I never have to present this slide at some point in my life. That's why I speak wherever I can, because we want it to be so natural that everyone goes, of course it is. So it should be as natural as eating at Chipotle's. Do you guys have that out here? Yeah. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Do you guys like it? <clears throat> okay, yeah. So we like it in California. So if it's that important for you to eat there, which it is to this guy, then we think it's that important for you to give to the world.
right? If you can go, yeah, I want Chipotle, and you get that hunger, you're like, I want to go to Chipotle. You should be going like, shoot, I didn't make my $5 donation this month. I should have done something, even if it's $5. And if you can't do that, then smile at a homeless person on the street. Philanthropy is not money. It is not giving money. It is the love of people. That's what philanthropy is. It's the love of humanity. So if you can't give money, don't worry about it. You can be a philanthropist now by being kind to someone in this classroom, by smiling at people as you're walking down the street that you don't know, by talking to someone at the bus stop and telling them you like their sweater. But it's got to be genuine. Don't do that if you don't like their sweater. And I'm serious about that. Be genuine. And it comes from the heart, and that's loving people. I'm not interested in people saying, well, I want to make it big and become a philanthropist later. Become a philanthropist now. Start being loving now. So, now that we covered love, let's move into money. <laughs> How do we make money? Universal Giving Corporate, second service. This is difficult because now we're managing again a second service in a different way. We help companies creating their global strategies all across the world and help them with their NGO vetting in more than 100 countries. So, for example, we go into Cisco and BHP Billiton, Saber, RSF, GAP, Floor, Symantec, and we help operate their global CSR programs. We create global strategy and operational planning. We perform the NGO vetting locally and internationally, customize vetting six to 24 stages, and we disperse payments. That means we send out the money all over the world in really tough areas that are tough to get the money to. So we are basically saying, we're gonna help you, company, decide where to give your philanthropy, where to volunteer, and we're going to vet the NGOs, we're going to find the right NGOs, we're going to vet them, we're going to help you set up operations all over the world. We coordinate calls with the people in Brazil and Paris and everywhere, make sure everyone is all on the same page, that we've got a certain basis that we always do, and then other that's free and, and free form according to the culture that we operate in. Paris is very different than Sao Paulo, than Peru, than different areas. And so then we do that, and then what we do is we help disperse the funds. And then we have excellence in innovation and client service ongoing with a 24-7 team. So here we go a little bit into one of the most important parts is our NGO vetting. We've talked about this being proprietary. And I'll show you all the things that we do. That gives you a quick snapshot. And then, right, it's a lot. We start off the six stages and now we do all of these different ones. Emergency vetting is interesting. If a company comes to us and said, I need this vetted, my CEO just says they want to do a campaign, I need to know this nonprofit's okay, then we go and we vet for them immediately, try and do it as quickly as we can. So these are all the innovations that we look at. Of our team, we're 70 people, 70% 70 are interns and returnees. We have more than a, we have a workforce all across the world. Flexible positions and execution, we're age agnostic, some of my top performers. The person who did this slide is 23. She's phenomenal. I don't care about age, I'm not interested in that. Don't ever classify yourself by age. My Oma was 97 and she taught a flute up until Stanford. She was blind in a wheelchair, could barely hear and taught three months before she passed on age 97. She was the first woman at Juilliard at flute. I'll tell you a story, because she's still with me now, even though she's not here on earth. And she told me what happened when she got into Juilliard. Her name was Frances. And at that time, you could be a nurse, a teacher, or a secretary. And she wanted none of that. So there was a flute. So she picked it up. And many of you these days kind of figure out, I want to practice my flute. But for my grandmother, her parents punished her if she did something wrong by taking away her flute. And she loved the flute. Well, she got into Juilliard. And she showed up. She said, I'm Frances Blaisdell. And the woman said, oh, no, 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 no. I'm sorry. We don't accept any woman here. I thought you were Frances with an I. But it was Frances with an E. She ran up those stairs and got up to the top. And Barrere was there, one of the top French people, um, teachers in, Fran in France on flute. And he said, he shows, pulled out her flute and started playing for him. And he said, you tell them immediately, you get a scholarship here. And that's how she got through. Sometimes you're gonna have to run up those stairs. Remember my Oma, she did it. She tested out 35 times for the NBC Symphony before she was finally accepted because she was a woman and it wasn't acceptable. The 35th year she made it in. So anytime I get tired, I go, I don't think so, Pamela. Amazing woman. 
Internships and returnships, we give high level experience across major business units, marketing, development, SEO, product development, corporate social responsibility, NGO services, social media, finance, engineering, all of that. If, you, if you've got it, we'll put you into serious positions of professional experience within three days. If you need more training, fine. We've got coaches for you, but I want people literally getting in there and having real life experience. It's the only way you're gonna really excel in life. We have kind of a joke, and I've got internship things back there, but I mean, we make our hires, 70% of our hires are interns and returnees. And returnees are the people who are at a second phase in career, and they want to change their lives, and they come back and they return with us, and we end up hiring them. Because we don't know how to do blind hires. We want to see how you operate, you choose us, we choose you. So our interviewing process is very unique. So how do you want your start your journey as a social entrepreneur? We're going to cover this briefly and then go into questions, and I know we're hitting late here, so thanks for your patience. Personal story, your ladder, and the right building. That's what I want you to think about. Your personal story determines who you are. You could be Oprah. You could be my sister, who's an interior designer. You could end up being, who do we know here? Richard Broadhead, or you could end up being Matt Nash, right? <laughs> Decide who you want to be. He had a beautiful flower, and he grew up out of that. Somehow he was a seedling down there. Now, I don't know why Matt's seedling's disappearing, so is Broadhead's. We need to make sure we're cultivating this. We'll throw some fake improv water on it. Okay, good. And uh, the point is, is that you can be any of these things. It doesn't matter. And don't think you have to go do good either. My sister is doing good. She's an interior designer, and she's building beautiful homes for people. Great. Follow your calling. It's not always going to be in a nonprofit realm. Your career path is your ladder. Or your calling. You decide. You can have a job or you can have a calling. There's a difference. The next thing you have to look at is the organization or company you want to ascend at. It's not just to go find your calling. So for example, here's your ladder. It could be that or it could be this. It could be this or it could be that. But don't worry, you'll rebuild if you fall down that ladder. And that happens sometimes in life, so get back up again. It's important to choose the right building. What is this company in which you will prop your ladder? Don't just climb a ladder anywhere. Be thoughtful about the building. Is it ethical? Is it, is it where you really want to be? So is it shiny and up in the sky, or is it down to earth? Or is it cultural, or is it agricultural? Is it downtown, or is it South America? Before you begin, you have to have gratitude. So you're starting and you're figuring out your ladder, you're figuring out the building, but before you start, because I hear people so much angst about this, just be grateful for where you are. Be grateful you're at Duke. Be grateful you're getting good friendships here. Just be grateful for everything you've been given in life. So many opportunities. Because there's so much angst these days about finding out what you love to do, right? I hear it all the time. And I went through that because I went through my midlife crisis when I was 24. I went through four jobs in four years. My friends were doctor, MBA, lawyer from Duke. And they're like, social what? Social entrepreneur in the 90s? That didn't exist. So you have to sometimes carve your own pathway. There might be an industry out there. There is an industry out there that hasn't been existed yet, but maybe you might help create it. So start with that gratitude. This all the time. How can I be grateful if my work didn't save on my computer, if I didn't get my dream job yet? You'll get it. I have too many assignments. My professor doesn't answer my email in the way that I want. I've heard that a lot. <laughs> That's not what he said. My cell phone died. I missed my workout. I received a C on an econ exam. That was a true story. It happened to me. I slept three hours this week. That also happened to me while I was at Duke. The cafe cafeteria coffee maker's out. Clearly that's not going to happen to you because you have free coffee. Lucky you. Be grateful. Um, I don't know what to do post-graduation. That was so me. Um, so most of the challenges you face, just to put this in perspective, they're luxury trouble. Their luxury troubles. So, I'm going to share with you someone special. This is my Oma that we talked about. I don't think I've seen anyone with more wisdom in her eyes, if you look closely. The greatest time I've ever spent on my life has been on the floor. Absolutely on the floor. And don't miss these things about being on the floor and how important it is. When I went over to my Oma's house on Saturdays, I was really not the smartest chick in the wood stack, whatever that is. Mm -hmm. My sister would go in the other room and watch TV. And my mom is here, are you ready? I'm like, yeah, I'm ready. 
and we get down on the floor and scrub the floor and we reorganize the Tupperware and we would make snickerdoodles which are cinnamon little pastries with leftover pie dough she never wasted anything and we worked and I loved it get on the floor have those experiences who are those people you can go watch TV or you can zone out on the iPad or you can get on the floor and have those experiences those conversations with my Omar are indelible in my mind and they've guided me today when I go through tough times so value your relationships, enjoy and learn from all your experiences. Trust your pathway, there is no rush. Don't rush to get or make your calling happen. You can't rush it, you have to be persistent but you can't push it. Some of you might find it when you're 40. Some of you might have found it when you're 18. It's all a pathway. So then marry your story, here I am. Tomboy, with your calling in Mexico, and live your spark. That's what you want to do in social innovation. You want to live your spark, that spark that makes you not even want, it makes you not even want to sleep, forget, get up in the morning, because you're so excited, this is your calling. So I look forward to seeing you succeed in social entrepreneurship, but most importantly, in life. And with sparkles, because I love sparkles. Thank you. So do you have any brief questions at all? Because I know we're hitting the end here. Any questions, feel free. I'm very open about how tough or positive it's been. I've got time for a couple. Yes. Well, I'm just curious. How What's your name? You said like the money was going to like Kiva, who would then like choose who it goes to. Yeah. So you're actually able to give it to like the people. Wow. Yes, yes. So, so, so we give it directly to the nonprofit. You know, and I love Kiva. They're a great organization. But basically, what they're doing is they're curating everything. And what you're seeing up there yeah. are examples of who you're giving to. Mm -hmm. But you're not. So they did a great model, and, and I was like, wow, how did they do that? But yeah, they're not actually Christian. doing it, right? Like, how do you do that, right? So we give it directly to the nonprofit. But we have such tight relationships with the nonprofits. We are not looking to have a billion nonprofits on our site. We know them, we know them by name. If you look at VCs and their venture capitalist model, what they do is they say, is there a marketplace for this? Is it a good idea? And who is the management team? So that's why we have lots of vetting on leadership. If you look at most vetting services, they're looking at what's the overhead, what's the finances? We're saying, who are the people, right? So it's critical. So we know those leaders and we know that it's going. Now the next phase for us is what, what do we need to do? We need to say, oh, well, then, then it came to this person and upload it. But it's so time intensive and it's really, really difficult to do. And so the people that do that really are able to do it with a small amount of projects. We're going to start with a small amount. For us right now to do it for a thousand projects, can you imagine the amount of time to actually go to the nonprofit, find out where each donation went and all that? It's very hard. I don't think it's wrong, it's right. But the thing what we're going to do is we're starting that with about five nonprofits at the beginning and then we'll feature it on our website. But it's just so time intensive. One of the things I say to my team is, I'm, look, integrity rules over anything that's flashy or anything like that. We're not going to you know, guarantee or promise you something that's not happening. And I can't, uh, you know, it does go direct to those people, and we know it, you know that we see it, but we don't have captured all, every single, like, we can track your donation to this person yet. Okay. But it's coming, and it's going directly to the nonprofit, and we already know we can see, like, what they're doing. And they give us some testimonials. Right now, we can definitely say, okay, we know that these donations are going to these people, but we can't necessarily match up X person to these people. Yeah. So it's hard, right? And then you got to be transparent, so we try and be as transparent as we can. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Okay, so great. You yes. Um, In your, your name, please? Blair. Blair. Hi. Um, given that there's so many like opportunities to volunteer and give through universal giving, how do you, and a, a lot of the problems that people are volunteering about are really complex, how do you make sure that, like, as universal giving, you like completely understand the problem so that, like, or how do you make sure that the when the people are volunteering, like, they're completely understanding the problems that they're volunteering for? You know what, Blair? I don't like saying this, but you can't. To say that they completely understand those problems, part of this, what I think, Blair, is I think that the people who are truly benefiting are the donors and the volunteers because they're getting a mass education about what's happening out there. If I share with you what is really important to me at Universal Giving, it's not giving and volunteering. It's about revolutionizing people's lives. And that's the system that we're driving towards, is it's not just affecting the nonprofits on the ground. When someone comes and gives and volunteers, 
their whole lives are changed. Their perspectives are changed, their voting habits are changed, they have more compassion, racism decreases, prejudices or biases, things like that. And so what we're really looking is affecting the donor and the volunteer the most so that they change their life to see the world differently and take action in a different way. To us, this is the first step so that they're able to do it. Now, one of the things that we are working on in the future, which I think would be really neat, is what if you have like a little guide and the guide is like, here's the culture, here's the history. Here is the whole you know, context of the challenge. Because if you look at it, I'm going to keep it nameless, but a major, major, huge bureaucracy organization, nonprofit, went and built 1,000 wells in Africa. And guess what? They dug down into the water supply. The water supply was infected and poisonous and ended up killing people. And they built 1,000 wells where people thought it was water. They didn't check to see if the water was pure. There was water down there, but that's not even understanding. That's that's not even understanding your marketplace from a VC perspective, right? Like the VC would say, this does not have a good market for water, or you know, we need a market for water. Maybe we need to do bottle of water, whatever it is, right? So to really understand that, I can't even say that I do. I think you know, you could spend your whole lifetime trying to understand one problem in one local community, Blair. Just one problem in one local community, and to really understand the nuances of that. That's why I'm causeless. People say, what do you mean you're causeless? I don't champion one cause because I know from all my work out there, if you want someone to be able to succeed in life, you can't give them food and not education. You can't send them to school on an empty stomach. There's no six-year-old that can concentrate in school if you send them and they don't have any food. So to me, it's food, health, education, parents, mentors, um, being able to breathe air. I mean, you look at the context of the problems. I was in Beijing serving in there about 10 years ago. Naive. I'm looking up and I said, when does the sun come out? When? It doesn't. You've got permanent smog here. And 95% of the people of the air quality in China, 95% of the people are exposed to air that is not acceptable in the US. And in a recent survey by The Economist, 500 million children, when asked what a blue sky said, said they didn't know and they'd never seen it. How is that possible? So I can't even tell you that I understand. I study this. I love this. I'm a geek. I mean, you guys think I'm extroverted? Just wait. I go, go, go during the day. At the end, I become a huge introvert. I'm like, I just want to read. I'm done. Like, I'm, you know, I'm like, so, so I read because I have like a lot of energy. And then all of a sudden, have you ever seen those dolls where you press the bottom and all of a sudden they collapse? You know what I mean? Like, they're like this and then you press the bottom and they, yeah, and they go like this. They collapse. That's so kind of like me at the end of the day. I'm like, woo, woo. And then I'm like, boo. That's why I got off caffeine about like 20 years ago. I had an intern and I said, yeah, I've never done drugs. And we were training for a marathon. And I said, I've never done drugs. He goes, yes, you have. And I said, no, no, I haven't. I was drinking vats of Diet Coke like this and coffee and like I was eating a banana and, and Cracker Jacks, sugar and caffeine, all this stuff. So I tried to get off caffeine and it scared the living daylights off of me because I was a salsa and a swing dancer at night. And I'd go out and I'd go out till 11.30 and dance at night and I loved it. And then I got off the caffeine, no headache. I had to go to bed at nine o'clock for three months. It was pure torture. I'm like, I'm never gonna be a dancer again. My point, why, why did I get out? Okay, this is improv, right? Woo, I'm like all over the place. My point is, is that I don't know how that happened or where we got into that, but my point is you cannot know these issues, right? <laughs> there we go, I think it's time. Thank you very Thank you much. So much. Thank you so much, I'm sorry. Don't stop the Brian Center. She's like, uh, Rick Ross, Rick Mango, for more chat with the family. Yeah.